you're just like your dad you are. We've probably all heard those uh, terrible words said to us at some stage in our lives. But it's true, isn't it? We become like our parents. It's inevitable on some level. Uh, we develop their mannerisms. We uh, use their expressions. We perhaps even get into the hobbies and the activities that they do. We begin to look like them. We become like our parents. They rub off on us. They transform us. They change us. We become like our parents. Not a happy thought, granted, uh, as we begin our time together. But it's true, relationships change us. It's true, not just in a sort of parent-child relationship, but also in terms of friendships. You know, romantic relationships uh, change us. I can categorically say that had I not been married, I would never, ever have watched The Great British Bake Off. I'd never have had the joy of that programme. Relationships uh, change us. They transform us. We know that. It's true on a human level, but it's also true in terms of our relationship with God. Coming to know God, uh, coming to be in relationship with him, changes us. We begin to love the things that he loves. Uh, we begin to value the things that he values. Uh, we become like him. We're changed to be uh, like his character, to reflect his character. Human relationships and a relationship with God change us. They transform us. And that's where we come to the prophet Jonah. You see, Jonah is an unusual prophet because on some level he does know God. Clearly he knows who God is. He is a prophet sent by God. And yet, as we'll see through the book of Jonah, he doesn't really reflect God. He doesn't become like God. He doesn't love the things that God loves. He doesn't value the things that God values. He's a very unusual prophet. Now, I don't know if you've uh, read the book of Jonah as an adult, yeah, presumably you've heard the story before, even if it's just having read a story to your children or perhaps to your grandchildren. We know that somehow in the book of Jonah, uh, Jonah ends up in the belly of a whale, belly of a big fish. But the key thing about Jonah is that the whale the, or the big fish is not the main part of the story. The big thing about Jonah is the big God, the God who is in control of all things and a God who loves who is gracious, who is kind, who is compassionate, and who loves the nations, even though his prophet Jonah doesn't. Jonah doesn't reflect this God uh, that he's been sent by. And so over the next uh, four weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Jonah. So I'd encourage you, if you've got time, to read that through over the next few weeks. Why not commit to reading Jonah for yourself? Now this morning, we're going to look at chapter 1 of uh, Jonah. So uh, if you've got a Bible open, re perhaps reopen it, maybe you've closed it now, reopen it to Jonah chapter 1. That's what we're going to look at this morning. If you can't find uh, Jonah 1, it's just after the book of Obadiah. So find Obadiah and then you'll find Jonah. That was a joke. Uh, we're going to see three things in this passage this morning. The first is a surprising commission. The first part of the story is the first few verses, a surprising commission. Just look at how uh, Jonah chapter 1 begins. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now that's a pretty standard opening in many ways. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. God's initiative came to Jonah. It was his uh, task to send Jonah out. He commissioned Jonah. That's pretty standard. Jonah was a prophet, uh, someone who was God's uh, spokesperson, as it were. Uh, we can read about Jonah in two kings. He was a prophet used uh, in those days. But the surprising thing is the place that Jonah was to go to. You see, most, if at all, of the prophets went uh, to Israel or Judah. They went to God's people. They didn't go to the nations. They didn't go uh, to the surrounding nations around them. God's prophets prophesied about the nations. They spoke about them, sometimes favorably, sometimes not. Certainly God's plan was, was for the nations to come in to God's people, to be part of God's people. But explicit missionary activity of God's people going out to the nations was very rare in the Old Testament. Can you think of any examples of it? It was very surprising that Jonah was sent out uh, to uh, go to the nations. It was a surprising commission. But it was doubly surprising because it was to 
Nineveh. Now look at Nineveh, verse 2. It says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh was a great city, a big city, a powerful city. It was the capital at that time of Assyria. Now Assyria was a superpower in the ancient world, a major country, and they were the enemies of God's people. And they were marked by evil, by wickedness, uh, by being a barbaric nation. And Jonah is to go there. That is a surprising commission. And just look at the message that Jonah is to proclaim. He is to preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Jonah is to preach a message against the people of Nineveh, against the city. A message that they are wicked, that they have rebelled against their maker and presumably implicitly that they are to repent of that. Now that's not an easy message, is it? That's not, that's not gonna be a popular message. It will be a bit like today uh, being commissioned to go to North Korea, the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, and to proclaim to its leaders that they are wicked. That is a hard task. That is a surprising commission uh, from Jonah, that he is to go and to proclaim a message of judgment uh, to these people in Nineveh. Now last week uh, Johnny was uh, sharing from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Johnny said that um, God's love compels us to go out so that we go and proclaim a message uh, to a watching world because love, God's love compels us to go. So we are to go and proclaim the message. And this uh, chapter in chapter 1 of Jonah I think gives us two important uh, Two important themes, two important tips on how we are uh, to uh, proclaim that message and what we are to say when we are to go. The first thing that Jonah chapter 1, these, in fact these first two verses tell us as we go and proclaim the message to other people is that God knows all things. And look at verse 2 again. Uh, Jonah is to go and to preach against it because its wickedness has come up before him. Now that idea of it coming up before him is a way of saying that God knows what is happening in the city. Now you've got to remember these people in Nineveh are not God's people. They are not the covenant people of God. This is a pagan state. This is a state that doesn't know God, but yet God knows them. He knows who they are. He knows what they're doing and he sees their wickedness. He sees that their sin. It's a reminder that God sees all that we are doing. He sees everything that happens in our lives. And part of the message that we need to go and share with others is that God knows. God knows the wrong that we have done. God sees it and he calls it wickedness. He calls it wrong. So the first thing we need to remember as we go out uh, to share a message of God is that part of that message, not all the message, but part of that message must be that we need to be serious about the message of sin. And the second uh, uh, tip, the second thing from this passage as we go out, is to call people to repent. Now that's implicit here in the first few verses. It becomes much more explicit as we see Jonah uh, unfolding the story. Now repent is one of those words that just means to turn away from, to turn around from something. It's a bit like um, a sat-nav you've got in your car. If you miss the turning and you've got the sat-nav on, it'll say turn around when possible. And it will keep saying, turn around when possible, turn around when possible, until you eventually do turn around. That's what it means to call people to uh, repent. It is to turn away from the things that we've been doing, uh, to reject the old way of life, to turn away from those things and to go in a new direction, to go after God. That's what it means to repent. That's what Jonah was to proclaim to the people of Nineveh. Now those are two important things that we need to call people to do. It's not the only part of our message, of course, but we are to do those things. Now of course it is hard to do that. It takes wisdom, it takes winsomeness, and Jonah knew that it was hard. So we've seen a surprising commission, that leads us to the next part of the story, a surprising response. How does Jonah respond uh, to God's call, God's commission? Well verse 3 says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. 
Do you see the repetition? To flee from the Lord. It says it right at the beginning of verse three and right at the end, he was trying to flee, to run away from God. Now I know that there are lots of children watching. Children, this is a question for you now. I want you to shout the answer out. Obviously I won't hear you shouting it out unless you're Seth and Lottie, but I want you to shout out the answer now. Can you run away from God? Is it possible to run away from God? Yes or no? What do you think? Can you run away from God? No, of course you can't run away from God. Everyone knows that you can't flee from God. He's everywhere. He was in Tarshish, he was in Nineveh, he was in Joppa, he was everywhere. God is all in all, he fills the whole universe. The posh theological word is that he is immense. He is everywhere, all at once. In fact, this uh, verse uh, that says to flee from God's presence is actually the same phrase that David uses in Psalm 139 when he says, can I flee from your presence? Can I go from your spirit? Can I be away from you, Lord? No. The whole point David's making in Psalm 139 is you can't get away from God. And yet Jonah is trying to flee from the Lord. Now, why? Why is Jonah having that such uh, surprising response? Why is Jonah trying to flee from the Lord? Well, we're not particularly told here. Perhaps he was scared. It was a hard message to proclaim. Chapter four, he says that uh, the reason he didn't go is he knew that God would forgive them. Maybe he didn't like the Ninevites. Uh, Maybe that he was worried that if they repented, that somehow they would flourish as a nation and be a threat to Israel. It's certainly weird behavior for a prophet not to want people to respond to the message that they proclaim. Perhaps if Nineveh repented, it would show Israel to be uh, in the wrong when they're being stubborn and not repenting. We don't really know. But there is a lesson for us to learn. A lesson here in Jonah's response is that it's very easy to have things remain up here and not in here. It's very easy for us to know things about God and not let it change our lives. You see, Jonah knew something of God. Of course he did. He was a Jew. He, he knew God. He was in a relationship with God. He'd been commissioned by God. He knew God. He knew the word of the Lord, it says. And yet he sort of knew it here, but not down here. It hadn't transformed the way he lived. Don't you find that very easy to do as well? I certainly do. To know truths about the Bible, to know who God is, to love him, to know uh, gospel truths, to even have memorized verses of the Bible, and yet to sort of just know it here and not inside us, not in our hearts, to not let it transform us, to not let it change our lives, to change our hearts, our habits, our, our loves, our values. Jonah chapter one is a warning to us, not just to let our knowledge remain in our head, but to let it be in our hearts. And Jonah's going to find out the hard way. That was a surprising response. The final part of the story is a surprising contrast. The story is about to get dramatic. Verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. A storm comes, and it's a storm, a sign of judgment. A sign that God is is cross, he's angry with how Jonah has responded. And you can see uh, something of that in verse five, the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. They realized this is not just a bit of bad weather, it's not just a bit of uh, choppy weather coming back on the ferry from France. This is a serious storm. This is a sign of God's judgment. Now these are pagan sailors, So they say, call on your gods, you know, the multitude of so-called gods that they believe in, call on them, they say. They're afraid, call on their gods. Now you'd have thought at this point, Jonah would realize that he would repent. He would realize what's going on. He would repent of all that he's done. How does Jonah respond? What's he doing? Well, it says, verse five, Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Jonah is asleep not repenting he's asleep so of course they uh, they wake him and they cast lots uh, to find out uh, who is responsible for this and God in his providence ensures that the the lot uh, falls on Jonah Jonah is shown to be responsible 
very clear here. This storm is not a coincidence. This is because Jonah has rebelled against God. This is a sign that God is displeased with Jonah. It's a sign of his providence. The lot uh, falls uh, on him. And so what do they do? Well, in the end, they have to throw him overboard. Jonah says, uh, verse 9, when he confesses uh, who he is, which God that he worships. He worships the only true God, the God who made heaven and earth, who made the sea that they're in, the sea that was presumably swamping the boat. This is the God that he is running away from. God in his providence uh, shows that Jonah is responsible. And in response to that, the sailors are afraid. Did you notice fear comes up a lot in the passage? Verse five, the sailors were afraid. Verse 10, this terrified them. Verse 16, the men greatly feared the Lord. They fear God. Jonah, actually in verse 9, when he says, I worship the Lord, in the original, it literally is, I fear the Lord. You see, that's the surprising contrast. Jonah, a Jew, a prophet from God, claims to fear God. But actually, his life doesn't show that. He doesn't really fear God. But these pagan sailors who actually know very little about the Lord, they are the ones who fear God. And the story ends with a huge contrast. These pagan sailors, well, they are the ones who fear God and they are the ones who find salvation. Verse 16, they feared the Lord and they made a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. The story in chapter one ends with the pagan sailors finding salvation and Jonah floating down to the bottom of the ocean in judgment. Of course, we're gonna see next week that isn't how the story ends, we know that. But at this point, the contrast is between the sailors who fear the Lord and find salvation and Jonah who says he fears the Lord, but he isn't marked by that. And he's floating in the water. It's a huge contrast, a surprising contrast. And as we come to a close, there's another contrast I want to highlight, a contrast between Jesus and Jonah. You see, uh, Jesus, like Jonah, was in a storm, in a boat, and he was asleep. And like Jonah, Jesus also gave his life to calm the storm of uh, God's judgment. But unlike Jonah, in contrast uh, to Jonah, Jesus was a prophet sent by God who always loved his father, who always obeyed what his father said, who did what his father asked him to do, who went to proclaim a message of judgment, a message to turn away from sin and a message of hope. And he went to a wicked world and he gave his life for that message. You see, where I fail, where you fail, where Jonah fails, Jesus did not fail. He perfectly reflected his father's values. He loved his father, he obeyed, and he gave his life. Jesus didn't just know God up here, he loved his father and he did what he had to say. And he gives us a message of grace. Isn't that good news? Where we fail, where Jonah fails, Jesus doesn't. And that is grace for us this morning.